So I've just come in from freezing New York and I'm looking at beautiful Bell Harbor with the palm trees and the blue sky. Yeah. And that can seem quite superficial, yet you took seemingly superficially beautiful Bell Harbor and you went from it being no man's land in terms of Jewish presence. And now it is a flourishing hotspot. No pun intended. Um, and you made a, a, an oasis of Jewish life here. Can you take us back a little bit and tell us how you went from nothing to something so beautiful? First person, just to give you some proper credit, Sam Greenberg, Montreal Jew, who was a developer here. He had an apartment in South Beach where I was. Um, and one day he says to me, Rabbi, I'm the lock here. Bell Harbor. Bell Harbor. That was some distance. Some of my friends lived in Bell Harbor, but that's the extent that we knew it. He says, it's a jewel. That... <clears throat> he says, we'll make it happen. He says, ask the Rebbe, which I did. The Rebbe gave us a blessing. Well, the way it started, if I may, is that he made a deal with us. We come, we come up to this neighborhood. We stay in a motel. We had two children at the time. Javarleya was 10, Zama was five. We stay in a motel and, and then no pay, which was fine. And we're just going to do Shabbos. That's it, just Shabbos. I was not very excited about it. There was nothing here. And my children were having no one to talk to. And my husband said, we have to, we have to ask the Rebbe, which we did. And of course, his response was, Nochein HaDover, it's the right thing to do. And he gave us blessings for success. And when we started literally... Actually, I didn't get up in a break then because the Rebbe's statement, he only answers, Asker Latzion, Bracha Vatzlacha. Here he said, it's the right thing. Nochein HaDover. And everybody said to each, let's see, he's like a prophet that sees things that never happen. Because when, when the, the, one of the wealthiest people offers here, his name was Saul Tapley, who was vice mayor of the city, <clears throat> got to like each other, and uh, came to his, had a great conversation, I'm not going to get into all of it. He says, Rabbi, you're such a nice guy. I really like you. I'll be so poor, I'll do anything you want. First of all, can't call the place shul. It's too <laughs> colloquial. It sounds like fiddler on the roof. He says, secondly, got to kind of from your beard a little. You know, it just doesn't keep it look nice. And it takes off some of the black hat off, you know, just be a colloquial guy. This place is not ready for it. So I said, listen, the reason I call it shul because I want everybody to be welcome, but if Reformed Jews don't know what's, they don't know anything about shul. They don't know a synagogue. But a re religious Jew will know that's a shul. So it'll allow them without having to say orthodox, which was being nil here. And he said, I said, and secondly, he said, like, this is what he said, it's like hair will grow here. You can have a synagogue like that, that. So don't waste your time. So I said to him, I'm going to prove you wrong. And I'm going to make a wager with you. I prove you wrong. We're going to get a substantial amount of money from your organization here to help it. But if I'm wrong, if I'm, wrong I'm out of here. Shook hands on it. He became one of my biggest supporters. He's a beautiful person. Very much so, but the Rebbe has it. And he put on the film every day at the end of his life. And we, when he said that to you, were you a little unsure? Were you like, I hope I can make this happen? I says, the Rebbe always says, when you get the most the, the challenges, you know that's the direction you got to go. So I said, hit the spot. Well, the Rebbe was very direct with us. It wasn't a question of should we, will we, and we knew it was going to be good. We just have to put forth a lot of effort to break through a lot of barriers that we had here. No young children, mostly adults, and the adults were elderly. And my husband, when we were building the shul, he said, I need a air, an area specifically, strollers. And they, they looked at him, strollers, you mean wheelchairs? He says, no, I mean strollers. And today we really do have, you see, when you come in, there's that whole area for the, for the strollers. Hundreds, now we have hundreds, yeah. hundreds of beautiful children. And it's a... Uh, it's an, it is an oasis, and it's so fabulous. We have 10 kosher restaurants. That just goes to tell you how flourishing a, of a community has become. And we have visitors here from literally all over the world. We have a lot of um, Hasidim, a lot of secular Jews, all different types of Jews, and they, they love coming here. They feel welcome. They feel warm. They feel the Chabad presence. And this is because all the success of any shliach, I mean, it's, it's impossible to say that it's due to our own efforts, really, no matter how dedicated we are. It's the Rebbe's brachas, the Rebbe's vision, the Rebbe's continuous support of us constantly throughout all the years. And we've been on Shalifas for 55 years. 
oh, it's a long time. And never f did we feel that we were doing this alone. We always knew that the Rebbe was at our side, guiding us, directing us. We had direct contact on a regular basis with the Rebbe when he was physically present with us. And the encouragement and uh, letting us know that he's proud, but he was a very um, direct, very direct and a demanding, demanding boss. To give you a little perspective, perspective boss. of how, uh, how he participated in our lives. Yes, we would love to hear it. Yeah, just that was our next question. <laughs> there was a period of time where things uh, were very slowly. Politically, there were a little, you know, some tensions going on. You know, people, all kinds of human conditions that interfere sometimes with process. <laughs> and so it just happened by chance that I was offered to, have, to do something that I really thought I'd like to do. So I was offered to um, excellent salary to be a shliach. In uh, at that time, it's 1981, in the college campus world, which had not been developed at all, and to me it was great because I was interacting. So um, I said, "I'm going to ask the Rebbe." I said, "If this sounds like something we'd like to do, Hani was okay with it because our the benefactor was really for real, and he was going to take care. We we nobody ever took care of us, so we didn't have money for anything." But this guy says, you know, don't worry about it. That's it. That's right. So I wrote to the Rebbe. In Florida? Yeah. When it wasn't being in Florida, I would have to A lot of challenges here. Yeah. We had a lot of challenges. I would have to move to the Northeast. Right. But it was good. Boston or New York. So I asked the Rebbe. <clears throat> so I got an answer like immediately. At that time, they were only, you could send it through. They was fax, not fax, fax telegram. not telegram machines. The offices had these, tele, tele, like your dad father had that. You know, the, in the house. Oh, yeah. yes, the faxes. Yeah, yeah. faxes. And it's a telegram. Tele tele uh, yes. And yellow paper. So we had, so immediately, that's the way I communicated if I had access. Uh, and immediately, the Rebbe said, tell, he says to Rabbi Klein, he says, tell Schellenberg that you both understand Yiddish? Yes, but you can translate as well for our listeners. I don't, I said, go straight to English. I don't, do not take away free choice from anybody, but I would want her to just stay in Miami. So I... That was before you got that answer to go to Bell Harbor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. So I said um, to come to Miami. So I said, so I told Rabbi Klein on the phone, I said, please convey the following message to the Rebbe, that he took away my free choice. <laughs> oh, wow. Because that was a fact. <laughs> I would like, so I'm going to say, no, Rebbe, I'm not going to do it. Oh, wow. Did you get a response to that? Yes, I did. Oh. <laughs> that was a, a bundle, an extraordinary thing about it. I had got a response, and we couldn't send facsimiles that time. I was very excited. I flew to New York to see it. The Rebbe said one word, taken. I did take it away because you didn't have the clarity to see what was good. So I had to take away your clay. Knowledge that he'd... Yeah, he said that. He said, take it. And it was very unusual. The Rebbe said, I never saw this. Just translate take it. Take it, take it means I did take away your free right. choice. It's amazing. <laughs> that was a very direct. So I'm just saying, saying I, we had to purchase a house down here. We finally had to get a house. In order to purchase a house in Bell Harbor, Jewish, you couldn't get in. So I went with a friend of ours, a very secular name, and they pronounced my name. They couldn't say the ha. So it was honey. I said, okay, that's fine. Went to see this house. Did not get her answer from the room. And then three weeks passed, and finally we, we saw another one. And this was a completely different house that I wasn't crazy about. Because the first one, she was crazy. The first one I liked. It had a pool. It was just like all fixed up, nice little dollhouse. I thought that was great. By the way, the prices were not like today. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they weren't. So, I tell you. So for that, we didn't have a response. And for the second house, we had a response immediately. When I say immediately, within a few hours, but the Rebbe said, Mashana Maka, Mashana Mazel, Tova Vila Vracha. He gave his beautiful brachas on the house. So we went ahead with the contract. Chalamoid. We had an, a, a call from the secretary, and the Rebbe wanted to know, so how do you plan to pay for the house? We hadn't even thought about it. But he wanted us to buy that particular house, 153. That's the house he wanted us to buy. And it was large, and it didn't have a pool, and it needed work. But it, it would facilitate doing large Shabbos and a lot of uh, celebrations at home. Whereas the other house was a tiny little dining room with eight chairs. And this one I could fit 
You could fit, what, 30, 40. We can do whatever we want there. So the Rebbe had all this foresight, but he, even these little things, he directed our footsteps, but in, in, you know, in every way. We were very fortunate to have that, and we still feel that he's with us all the first time. Thing, the first, when I first saw my house, just, said, just an interesting vignette. First time I saw my house, my friend went with Hani, because it's just to give him an opinion. He actually owned one of the buildings in Pearl Harbor, so he had a real realistic background. When I first came and the salesman was big smiles there, he made sale. I'm standing on the porch and I'm walking up with Hani after closing. Hani said, I want you to meet my husband. And I've never seen this in my life. I go, no, the jaw falls. Oh my God. <laughs> it's like, oh my. He, he was actually thrown out of the community. This Delta. realtor was thrown out of the community. He was a blockbuster. He brought, not a Jew, but like the, the chief of the Jews, a <laughs> rabbi. He was thrown out of the community. I mean, he, he was made, sold the house. He was made to feel so unwelcome that he moved. He literally moved. He was a nice man. Yeah, I mean, he didn't know that we were Jewish. I mean, I wasn't coming on false pretenses. I didn't lie. He didn't ask me any questions. And I didn't want to move into Mount Harbor Village. I really thought that if they don't want us there, why are we going to a place that doesn't want us? And my husband has his great foresight, and he said, there will be a day that this community will really flourish, and there will be people who want to live in a, in a community that's gated with more security, and we have to break through this. This is ridiculous. When we moved, there were, there were no Jewish families in there. There was one mixed, mixed marriage, an Italian gentleman and a, and a Jewish woman, and he was the only one. He really fought against the village. He won, and when he won, because he wanted to have it, wanted to belong to the country club, they wouldn't allow him. So he fought. The Italian. The Italian fought because his wife was Jewish. That's why they wouldn't let him into. Yeah. Yes. They, put, they would not accept them. So he had a major litigation trial, and he won. And they, the village had to pay all of his attorney fees. And when he was all finished with that, he said, I don't want to belong to a country club that is so anti-Semitic. And he was making a powerful statement. And the community now is, is filled with all kinds of people. We have many Jewish families, many non, but it's a friendly environment. It's a cohesive community. We get along. It's really nice. They respect us. Just moving in there has quadrupled the prices of even more than that. It's gone off. I mean, no, it's again, to, I can, per, uh, about 100 to times. Uh, and the value of, of the homes in the village. Uh, but know, when, it's a great place to live. And Or of Hashem, we have many Jewish families there that participate with the shul or other shuls. Now we have four different shuls in the community. It's uh, an explosion of Torah. We now started a kolel at our shul just to like sort of round everything out. And we have a, a preschool. We go from the youngest to the oldest. That's really great. And it's also important to recognize, uh, I think, one of the strengths of the community because people, it just happens to be. And I, I don't think, you know, the tourist who was speaking, as Hani said, when we had my, our first Yechidus with the Rebbe 55 years ago on the way to Shlissus. Okay, that's my story. Well, I'm just, <laughs> that's my favorite But the Rebbe said he's coming. <laughs> he, the Rebbe said he's going with us. It's for me, that's. Wow. I, I, I do believe that there's been a, a tremendous divine providence in this space. The reason being, we started from snuffing. Usually come into communities where they're already staying, you know, they have already systems of reform or conservative or whatever the case. Here... The Jews that went to, to pray went to church. Right. So, and uh, they had as many Jewish members as non-Jewish members. Uh, there's many stories of that, uh, which I don't it takes to, uh, to tell you the stories, take a couple of books. But really, you should write a book. Yeah. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yeah. About what, what, what it was. What it was then. It is now. I just always so happy. We started the, this community based on the Rebbe's teachings. That was the foundation. Our charter is the Rebbe's charter. So we we could do whatever we wanted here because nobody's there to tell you what to do, and anything they told you was radical. So what's the difference? And slowly, people that had a little more the progressives, the liberal progressives, not the conservatives, are the ones that opened their hearts to the tshuva. You were so young at the time. I can't imagine. Like usually, you're influenced by your surroundings. And here you come. Not only are people different, but they're they're not even, you know, friendly to you, and you're. Yeah. Opposite of friendly, they threw eggs at our house. They, they, the police walked us home. They didn't believe that we actually lived in the village. I mean, that was a, a very challenging time. The state police that on Friday night when I would go home, I would 
they would follow me to make sure that I do live there. Because what else is this guy doing? Slowly they got to know us. Presently, the last time the police had that kind of an escort was when the chief, former chief of staff, John Kelly, who was, uh, we have a relationship with him, who came to our house to eat Friday night dinner, and you know, they had a helicopter sticking. So the police here also, all police chiefs, every one of the police chiefs, Balabar Bay, Harbor, Surfside, Indian Creek, they met with me in my office many times. They have such respect for the Jewish people, you cannot imagine. And the one thing we have to be careful, I don't know if you want to talk about that publicly, but really you have to be careful about the number, a few years ago, as COVID came in, the police chiefs met with me, yeah. and they wanted to know if the new group of Jewish people that are coming down from other places to be here, if they're a different kind of Jews, different sect. I said, why would we say that? He says, well, we have a problem, that's why we came to you. He says, they have no consideration for the law. They double park, they cross against the light, and he says, when a policeman says to him, please, you can't double park because the traffic is lined up through the bridge. So I said, what are you, a Nazi? He says, uh, we don't understand what's going on. We have to be so careful because it takes so many years to develop a community that respects you and looks at you at a higher level that these Jews are really good people. And then for foolishness, you know, you kind of break that mold. It's not, it's something that we have to be very much aware of because it's, I get feedback. Interesting. And it is good to know that we are an example and we have to, we have to be careful of the little things we do. But are you sensing anti-Semitism now? When the last time there was some threats of anti-Semitism, the police chief called me and says, Rabbi, I just want you to know, believe me, anybody who comes here with anything, don't be sorry they ever stepped over the border. So he said to me, we're here for you. It's a question of lifestyle that makes people respect you. It's very critical. Simple things. In Bora Park, Guy goes to the store and he's in a rush. He still pushes it. I only have three things. Here in Publix or wherever it is, the lady says, I only have five things. This is for people under 10 things. And it's, you know, this little things, what are we today after the October 7th? The most existential question that exists among the Jewish people is why am I a Jew? What's the, what's the value plus? That at the moment I'm born, I'm already in harm's way. You've got to be a real value to die for it, and I don't even have to do anything. I can even deny my Jewishness I'm still in the pot because it's a brand that you can't remove. So what is the question? What is it about you? The only answer that exists that is real, and that includes Torah in a different, a different discussion, we are a light unto the nations, and evil hates light by, na by nature. So that's who we are. So if we're not a light to the nations, we have all the negatives without the positive. And no chance of transforming the negative. You need to be that light. Yes. That's what we, that was we strive for. It. Then the big question is, how are you a light? That's a different conversation. I'm sorry, baby. You have to read the time of... Yeah. Uh, you can answer it. And the lives of their Champlain Towers. Yeah. All of the people that were there, whether they... What, didn't make a difference what religion they were. The color they were. They make a difference. We brought them into the shul. Our shul became a warehouse of anything that you could want. They needed coats, sweaters, jackets, food, mattresses, water, toiletries, anything at all, and food. And we fed the Jewish people the same food that everybody else ate. And some of them even came to my husband and said, Rabbi, I would like to convert. I never met a Jew, and I can't believe how you treat us with such dignity and so much respect. But I think the police saw how we dealt with the situation and that garnered another level of respect. Besides, we just, just to speak to this very little thing, because we were interacting then, the president came down here, you know, we had a lot of interactions, secular, secular media outlets were always interviewing us. And the one thing that was really remarkable, two things that were remarkable, was one, um, glot kosher meat, as you know, is five times as expensive as a cheeseburger. So they're serving the regular population, which is hundreds of families and people who couldn't hear me. And also there are 3,000 rescue workers. You know, hamburgers and cheese. But the Jewish people, they had steak stations. So we came in and I said, listen, gentlemen, everybody gets steak. It's going to cost more. That's the cost of it. Nobody gets any more or less than anybody else. To them, that was like extraordinary. Right. 
Another factor is these men would have worked on the on the on the pit like they called it the holy the, pile. The, the, whole, the holy pile they called it. They were, so they would meet together in, in the middle of shifts uh, because on the pile there were like 150 at each time. And there were various shifts they worked 24 seven. So during the shift period, I was invited to talk to them a little bit. The fact that they were imbued with a spirituality of what they were doing beyond just the work of saving, the, beyond that factor, it really, I, the comments that I got from these, you know, 150 pound firemen, they were all muscle, and that you might say these are not, they were so sensitive, they were so connected. So you see where Jewishness played a, a tremendous, Jew, living Jewishly played a tremendous role and a positive impact. But these are examples of how to be the light. Yes. Yeah. That's, we, we have to realize one thing, if you're serious about it, particularly when you're a shliach. When you're a shliach, you're not, you're, not a, you're not an employee. An employee, after five, you're not an employee anymore. Before 9 a.m., you're not an employee. Nobody will tell you what to do, how to do it, and so forth. When you're a shliach, is 24-7. What does that mean? You represent a certain ideal, a certain person, an ideal. And you have to stop to yourself and think to yourself, at any time that you're doing something, am I representing the Rebbe? Because when I'm going to do this, whoever sees me says, this is, this is the Rebbe's emissary, which means I'm representing this person. I'm not the person, God forbid. You know, we're not a Rebbe. We all need a Rebbe. You know, it says, by Moshe, you believe in Moshe like in God. It says in the Torah last week, by Amin of Hashem, and Moshe Abdo. But you need that clairvoyant clarity of vision. And so when you're asleep with the Rebbe and you don't accept that vision in your practical, everyday, interactive life, you're not going to be a top-level sleep. You can't. So a great privilege and an honor to be representing the Rebbe. So yeah, every decision you make, you have to think this through very carefully. This is going to reflect on the one who sent us here. It, is this something that he would be proud of? And this is very important as, as a sleep. You, you can't take this. It's a mission. It's a way of life. You can't take it lightly. The one thing that I, I get angst from is sometimes you have to do something a little out of the box and you're just burdened with the question, what would the Rebbe say about this? What would the Rebbe be able to go to the Rebbe? Yes. And that's something that's different for you now. Well, it's a little bit not so different because I've been able to access usually anything that I'm doing that I've through like different friends who are knowledgeable to do that professionally, I'm able to access information that were men talked about this in particular matter, which is great. Well, we know hundreds and thousands of letters that the Rebbe would respond. Letters, talks. These all the conversations and, and personal stories, and you glean from that, and then you just put things together, and you, you speak to your mashpi, and you try to figure out how, and then you pray that this is the right way. As long as your intentions are noble and pure and good and that, they're motivated in the right way, and sometimes it, we might make a mistake. We're humans, but we do the best we can. And that's We're not, I'm not diminishing the fact that there are people today that did not meet the Rebbe. Not diminishing that, because the Rebbe says he finds ways. Mm. I, honey and I, thank God, we didn't need those ways, because it says in Hasidus that your first Yechidus with the Rebbe is when he sets your path for life. So, you know, you never think about it because you're a lot younger and so forth, then you think, which kid is the one that I was really mature and I knew what I was doing and asking questions when I was a kid, when I went in after Rebbe Mitzvah? It doesn't matter, but the Rebbe generally, the main things that he tells you in life at given moments when the Rebbe does tell you something, those are the fundamental underlying factors that give you the ability to do what you can. So for us, and I think this is really important for everyone to hear because it's not just meant for us, I think it's for Oshlofen. We were just a very young couple. We were 19 years old. I was 19. My husband was 21. And we went in for that first audience, which was, it, it was going to be the deciding factor of our, what we're going to do with the rest of our lives. I've said this before, but I think it's important. My mother was uh, of the opinion, my, my maternal grandparents were Shlofen of the previous Rebbe in Russia and then in France. They were in France for many years. When the entire family left, my grandparents stayed. And when they wanted to leave, when they were getting a little bit older, they asked for permission from the Pregnant Rebbe if they could now live either in Israel, where they had a son, or Brooklyn, where they had two, two daughters. 
And the Rebbe said, if you leave, it'll be a Rachmanis on the Parisian jury. So they couldn't leave. They wouldn't leave until my grandfather got ill, and then they, then they moved to Israel. So when we went into Yafidus, I knew that that I knew what that meant. I mean, when men shlif us and going out as an emissary couple, and it meant that it's a one-way ticket, and it was a very serious moment. And although I wanted to do this all my life, I mean, I think because I was, I think I was hardwired to be a shlucha from everything that I learned at home, the, 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 the hospitality that my parents lived their lifestyle. Anyway, so my mother said to me, but whatever's on your heart and you feel like you want to share with the Rebbe, this is the time. This is a very important moment in your life. So I said, okay, but we walked, we walked our little merry way to, uh, we just married uh, 10 months and we were walking towards um, the Rebbe's office. And my husband said to me, listen, Khan, I know that you, you, you know, you like to talk, you like to express yourself, but when you stand in front of the Rebbe, you, you don't say a thing. You just listen and that's it. I said, okay, I'm going to listen. Your mother told you one thing. My mother told you something else. <laughs> I'm walking and saying, well, now that I'm married, I'm going to listen to a good wife. I'm listening to someone. And so we presented our paper to the Rebbe. He looked at everything. He looked up at us and he gave us the directive that he, that Miami should be the place for us to go to. Now, I, 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 I lost it. I, I, it just hit me suddenly and out it came without my realizing what I was doing. And, and I said to the Rebbe, uh, almost pretty much exactly what I'm going to tell you. I've rehearsed it in my mind many times. Like, I want to go. I was talking for myself. My husband, there was not even a question. He was standing there. He was white. And, and I was, and I was, <laughs> I don't think he was so excited about my little outburst, but I said, I want to go and, and do the Rebbe's will or do, do the Shlifas, but it's going to be very hard for me. First of all, I don't know if I'm going to be able to be, do justice to my Shlifas. I just don't know. And second of all, it's going to be very hard for me to leave this, this place. I loved living where I lived. I loved my life. In Crown Heights. In Crown Heights. I was happy at school. I was happy at home. I was happy with my friends. And this was a whole new, a whole new, entirely new uh, world that would open up. And the Rebbe, like, he raised himself off his chair a little bit. He stretched out his hand, like, really wide. And he said, I'm going with you. But he said it with the most beautiful smile. And then he added something very important. He said, But it must be with joy. And that's really what kind of can. Another line to that. He, he says, because this was, to me, that was a piece de resistance. Yes. Because the Rebbe said, because if you're not with joy, where are you taking me with you? It has to. So it, just, so it meant to say to me, I'm going to be with you whether joy or not, but please don't take me with you without joy. So As if he said, he would say, if not, I won't go. But he didn't say that. He said, why would you take me? So that told me, and he was, he's been with us through the thick and thin. And Simcha was definitely something that we needed because you know, there were challenges, many challenges. Uh, we had a hard time. I, it took us three years until our daughter was born. There were five years between our two children. Deborah Leigh was five when our son Zalman was born. So this was trying times because I want, we wanted to have a large family. And uh, so the Simcha was really an integral part of it all knowing that that the way to serve God properly is our voice Hashem Basimcha. And on a regular basis when we would write about there were many challenges. There were challenges that we we didn't have food to eat. It was we were such proud Shluchim that we wouldn't share with our parents the the trauma that we were going through that it was I remember opening the door every day to our little apartment and saying, Oi, please Hashem let the electricity be on. I mean we wouldn't want anybody to live like that, but we did for quite a few years. But we remember that what the Rebbe would answer, and when we would write whatever it was, he gave us beautiful blessings. But every letter always ended with either "Serve God with joy" or "Avodas Hashem b'Simcha" or "If do, you shall serve God with joy." So we know that to be successful, you need to move forward. You need to know where you're going and what you're doing, but you have to be joyous in, in what's going on. And and we feel that that was really what got us to where we are now. And during your challenge, some of your challenging times, how did you find that joy? From within. And I, we, we talk about it sometimes, like, where did it come from? I think when the Rebbe said that to us, he empowered us with the ability to do that, to look beyond the moment and understand that if we're here and we are his emissaries, we're going to be successful, but we have to follow his, his direction. He said, I'm with you. I'm going with you. So he was at our side. 
through it all. And you have to be, you have to be, enjoy. listen, they were, we're human. And there were times when it was challenging. I went through a very difficult time in my pregnancy. I was in a terrible fire. That's why you can hear me cough and my voice is quite hoarse. And at, I remember when I woke up from that fire after being at the hospital, I was in the hospital for two weeks. It was very, very difficult expecting a baby, being in a fire, not knowing, you know, what would be the Rebbe gave us the blessing that we would have a good and and a good and with no child and the right child in the right time. And Devorle was born on Tess Kislev, and she was born in the on our due date. Everything that 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 happened was feeling and knowing that the Rebbe was with us. But yes, it was very challenging, and there were times where I would I would get down, and that's where my husband would lift my spirits. And then when he would get down because of the fundraising, when the challenge was so great, um, I would be there to support him. I think that that's really the uniqueness of being a couple shliach, that you're there for each other in the, in, the, in the good times and in the challenging times to help each other through the process. We had shared dreams, shared goals, and in order to make them realities, we, we, we had to be there for each other. <laughs> Lifted each other out, yes, on a regular basis. Also, a relation till this day, a relation with the Rebbe, he, from my perspective, and, and there were times. I mean, if you, you you can't imagine that, and I can't imagine it either today. I tell you, I could not imagine it. Our home was foreclosed five times by the bank, and each time the reason that the foreclosure didn't happen is because the lawyer for the bank I put on film with him, so he kind of used to put some, it just may a little to give me another month or two. And when you had that kind of circumstance, you had to get up every morning. And the first thing on your mind, oh my God, the, I'm going to have to answer 15 phone calls. The bus driver didn't get paid. Teachers haven't been paid already for a couple of months. Electric is on the char- charge. We had to plug into another building to have electric. And you just kind of wake up and your stomach's churning. It happens on a pretty regular basis. And at that moment, you find, because I, I saw the Rebbe's interpretation of the difference between faith and trust and Munan Betach. Fundamental difference. Faith, it says a thief, when he's about to steal, he also says, God, make sure I don't get caught. It's such an external factor. It does not penetrate internally. Trust is trust. The best example of that, I'll give you a simple example. You go to a circus, and you're 5,000 people sitting at the bottom. You have a guy on the, on the, on the wire. And he's crossing over. And he's riding, he's riding a bike. And the guy says, everybody down here is, everybody believes 100% he's going to cross over. You have faith that he will cross over. The guy that has trust gets on the bike with him. So I believe that Shluchim have trust in the Rebbe. When the Rebbe said something, it was not a question of if it was a question of when and how, and at the fire, the rebbe said we had a yeshidus right after the fire, when she was able to travel. And the rebbe said, Did, "Was there any marks left on your body?" So, and then he says, "No safe of the ice after fire, you're wealthy." After that fire, we never had a problem again paying our election bill. Wow! <laughs> yeah, that was uh, wow. you actually saw. So after a fire. <laughs> I feel fire that's after that wealth as a right, but it could also mean wealthy in other ways as well. Right. That yeah. went out and and well, they, it, just in that factor, it's a good deal. We wanted a larger family. You know, he asked the one child, one child. So at some point, the Rebbe said, uh, "Spirit, spiritual children are also children. You have many children." So the moment we were went into for this, we went into to the audience of the Rebbe. We had many. We were so fortunate, and I was quite vocal. And I asked for an, for a bracha, and the Rebbe told us these words. It was very interesting words. As ved zain, zin on tefter, which translates literally, They're there both. will be sons and daughters. Now, but what we heard was that we will have sons and daughters. But the Rebbe didn't say that. He said there will be sons and daughters. So after our son was born and time went on and we saw that was nothing was happening. So I would say, Shalom, the Rebbe never said anything that didn't happen. What does he mean? He says, spiritual children are like biological children. And that worked for my husband, but it wasn't working for me. And I was still thinking, what did the Rebbe mean when he said, you'll have son as vet sign, there will be sons and daughters. 
And then I have this special wine that I really want to mention because we got this little bottle of wine from the Rebbe that he had given to a doctor who had asked for a blessing for children. And the Rebbe gave him a bottle instead of the kosher bracha that he would typically give. So I I asked for this little bottle. I put it in my refrigerator, and I had no idea what I was going to do with it after that. And two days after, I, well, there was a knock on her door, and a woman came in, a South American woman, very lovely woman, to tell me that her daughter had just had a miscarriage, and she's very upset. And she says, what, what can I do? How can I help her? I said, oh, my gosh, wait a minute. And I went to my fridge, and I said, I have this bottle of wine from the Rebbe, specifically for the blessing for children. And, and then I literally, at that moment, I created a, a protocol with her. Well, if she's going to drink the Rebbe wine and have a child, then she has to observe the laws of family purity. And how was well, she going to drink at the wine? She has to, her husband has to make kids wish on the wine. And I gave it to her. I gave her a little bottle and told her exactly what to do, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to fast forward the story. And then some family member came to me and gave me a lot of pushback and well, who gives you the right to give out wine and, and say, tell them a protocol, like, you're not a Rebbe, how do you do that? So I, there I am thinking, maybe I'm doing something wrong, I don't know. So I called the Rebbe's secretary, and I asked Rabbi Klein, and I told him what I was doing, and he said, it's fantastic what you're doing, it's just you make sure that whatever you repeat in the Rebbe's name, you tell the people that is the Rebbe's name, and if it's something that you created for whatever the reason, then you just make mention of that. So I do want to say this, that today... Right now, of the babies that I know of, there are sons and daughters, multiple ones, hundreds, 451 beautiful Jewish babies, boys and girls, all over the world, have been born through the blessing of this Rebbe wine. She has a branch in California, have, her sister. My, I gave it to my sister in California, and, in and I have one in my sister-in-law's in, in Brooklyn so that we can expedite. And uh, I'm on the phone. It's, it's really become a very integral part of my of Mashlachas over the years because... There were women who call me that have been married for multiple years and through our conversations, and I speak to every one of them. I didn't print out a list and give it to them at the protocol. I speak to every one of them. I feel that the Rebbe told me to do this when he said there will be sons and daughters. So, you know, it takes nine months of gestation and you feel that the, 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 the baby growing. Well, you, you have to invest time and heart and soul into a woman who's going through challenging times with infertility. It made a difference in, in people's lives because they... It's a tzedakah every day. It's a bit tochan and amuna. It's uh, reciting a certain chapter of Tehillim. It's it's giving tzedakah, tzedakah daily, mentioning your name and your mother's name and your husband's name and his mother's name. It's a review of the laws of Tarasim It's a whole big protocol. And they leave the phone conversation, you know, so uplifted, full of hope. And I tell them, I'm not a Rebbe. I'm just giving you wine from the Rebbe. And we pray that this will be a vehicle through, for your blessings. But that's up to Hashem and um, bring smiles to a lot of people's faces. And I look at these children, some of them send me pictures, and I feel like that this is what the Rebbe meant. There's will be sons and daughters. pictures. And it, 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 it makes, it's like, wow, I really feel like I have all these little grandchildren. We were just in New York a few months ago, and we were eating at one of the local uh, restaurants, and a woman came up to me and she said, I never introduced you to my family. And I want you to know that this wine that you gave us here, here are my children. There were four children there. I mean, right there and then, the two of us started to cry. It was so emotional. I mean, she had sent me a note and a picture, but I never met them in person. Here are these four beautiful children that the Rebbe had, I feel, gave me a personal, a personal shlifa. So you're not going to have all these biological children, but you will have many beautiful grandchildren all over the world. And There's so many of our community. Our community is multi-generational. Like the Balchugas of uh, four years ago. <laughs> Their children already went to Jewish schools. Their grandchildren are already into it. So there's so many families, young families, that you know are, are from that group that they call me their Zaidi. I'm like, yeah. Zaidi, because they never had a Zaidi. Yeah. Wow, that is yeah. very special. That is just and not only. And, and it just, it, the Rebbetson had said herself, the Rebbe's wife had said, they, she, they couldn't have children, the Rebbe and the Rebbetson. And the Rebbetson had said, my children are in 770. Are in 770. And this is the same, the same, I... I just think and, and you know, when I think about the Rebison, if if I if I were to choose two role models in my life, and it's a very personal kind of a question and a response to myself, who who is my role model? Who is that person that is a paradigm of of someone that you can never be that person, but 
the qualities of what they represent. So for me, it was always the Robertson. I did not know her well. She was a very private person. But as a child, I remember how the Robertson would drive to 770 on a given Mose Shabbos Saturday night to pick up the Rebbe after Shabbos. And my, we would come, my father would park his car somewhere and we would go home with him on Mose Shabbos. And this one particular time was an amazing experience. The Rebbe was driving, so the Rebbe was in the passenger seat. We're driving, we're driving up, and my father does not want us. There's a sight that's behold. My father does not want to drive up to be, you know, perpendicular to the Rebbe because then my father would be sitting and the Rebbe's right at the passenger side. So he was trying to avoid moving closer to the Rebbe's car. So you would drive up to get a peek. Parkway, and but what we wanted to see. Yeah. So his, <laughs> my father had no choice. They were beeping him, so he moved up. And the rebel looked at us into the car, at us, and he waved. He waved to us with a loving smile. Ah, it was a moment that I'll never forget. First little glimpses of of a uh, of a tenderness and a gentleness that the rebbe he could do that for his chassidim was amazing. When we went to the whenever I went to the rebbe, and I went often. So when I went with someone, one of uh, lay leaders, I would go very confidently. And I'd come to the rep and I'd introduce him when I went myself. Ah. Oh. I was in terror yeah. all the way to the rep. It like took me, with the, when I went with somebody, it took me five, ten minutes to get there. And myself, I got in line, it took me like two hours. And I said, oh my God, the rep could take one look at me. He know exactly what I did night I didn't do. Uh, and I would stand there like shem. Yeah. I, I, and every I, time, I, it was like a split second. Uh, you walk by the rep and the rep would say something to the so it was transformational. Instead of feeling that he felt uplifted, you know how I do it, oh my gosh, you know, like it a lot. To be able to do that just by a, an eye contact and a, and a word, oh, it was, it's something that's beyond rationality. The Rebbe smile could put, not just put you at ease. So my first contact with the Rebbe was when I was six years old. It's very interesting. We came from Paris. We were born in France, our, four of our children, four of my parents' uh, children. My older brother was born in Austria, and then Paris. We, so we went into to a private order unit. So that was like the highlight. We all got dressed up in our, it, whatever we had, the most respectful clothing. We went to see the Rebbe. The Rebbe looked at me. I'm the second, not the first. I'm the second child. And the Rebbe looked at me, and he said to me, so do you know how to say Shema? Shema Yisrael? I said, yes. So the Rebbe said, so could you please say it? And I, and I said, I told you I was very vocal. So I said to the Rebbe, you can't just say Shema just like that. can't even imagine what went in. I can't even imagine what went through my parents. I was like, that, 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 that. You can't just say Shema. So the Rebbe pointed the, oh, again, that smile. that I, I need, The Rebbe gave me this most beautiful smile, make me feel comfortable. And he showed me to the window. He said, look, it's getting dark. You could say Shema now. So I stood there like a little soldier and I recited the whole Shema. And there was just the tenderness, the gentleness, the love that he had for every person young and old, and I'll never forget the way he would look at us and, uh, yeah, and so we, we would go into private audience every year. We came to New York, my family and I, because we had traveled on the same sh on the same transport as the Rebbets and my family. So we went into for this. I was a kid. I must have been at that time. I was eight and a half years old. And, you know, coming to New York was already experienced. We used to go by bus or by train, come to the gas station with hundreds of bags packages and you know it was little, like little immigrants and they would get on the subway and we'd take up the whole subway and this was rush hour and we'd pile up our bags and boxes that was a different issue uh, so when you came to the Rebbe and you said this you know, the Rebbe's time was very valuable so uh, I was a kid and I just learned like a page and a half of Talmud by heart I was like a special thing and I learned to so Rebbe says to me what are you learning I said but let see he said, what did I say? I said, El, which is, he says, yeah, he says, you say over with. So I started saying it. <laughs> and, my, and the rebel's looking at me, I didn't, I figured, when do I stop? He, I take the whole page and a half, it must have taken about six minutes. And there was said, listening to me say this thing. And I just went, went for it. So, so watching and knowing how the rebel dealt with people, it is really how we based our, what we based our shalachas upon. It's just everything is divine providence, and you're sitting here today, and I couldn't believe on 
on Matzah Shabbat on Saturday night, I, um, every week there's a living Torah with about 15, 20 minutes of something about yes. the re- inspiring that the Rebbe shared. And it was about the Aleph Institute. And um, I, I was so inspired by the message you had shared that the, the Rebbe's message was that bad people don't do bad things. It's good people that make mistakes. Yeah. And I thought that was a very powerful message. And the Rebbe had shared he wanted someone to start going to visit the prisons to, to give the prisoners an opportunity to do Teshuvah. And you took this opportunity to go visit the prisons and you created a huge organization now, the Aleph Institute. And so, I'll, just, I'll just tell you one point, and maybe one day we'll continue the conversation. Okay. So when the Rebbe gave this talk, he, at a later date when we started the uh, Aleph, he gave, I brought him a, a group of prisoners from 20 different institutions. They gave us permission. We had a lot of credibility. And I brought him to Fabringen. I'm not going to tell you all the stories of that because of my time constraint. Just So at that Fabringen, the Rebbe gave a talk. It was Shabbos of, Sh- of Shuot. And the Rebbe gave a talk about the first chapter of this, in the book of Ezekiel, which is the toughest chapter. It's called the Maisa Merkava. And he talked to me, talked about the rabbis. And he said, the rabbis, usually they sit on their laurels. You know, you got Smith for 20 years ago. You still have, so you got to do it again. And, learn, and he kind of laid out the rabbis because it's time when rabbis come. And he started talking about the prisoners. Same thing. And he said, there's a big question here. God loves us. He says, prison is a exile with the exile within the exile, triple exile. Why? The first exile is the soul and the body. I really say so. So there's a big challenge to live in this animal. The second challenge is exile. Or in call this a world where we're under the jurisdiction of nations. Third exile is prison. It's such an exile that you don't even have to put him as a zoo. That's how big of an exile it is. So how does Hashem send his people to go into such darkness because their objective of goal is to save the sparks to collect the energies that are here. So how to just send this beloved children? It says as follows. It's not a simple person that has to go to that space. Only very special neshamas, special souls, that Hashem has endowed the ability to go into absolute abstract darkness and to not only not get get underscored or under well overwhelmed by the darkness, but to transform that darkness to light that's the special people that are in this system. So all of a sudden, these prisoners, when we translate for them, they blew their mind. He says, I never heard of a rabbi. He's knocking the rabbis and uplifting the prisoners, you know? That's great. <laughs> and the rabbi did a few things that indicated his sensitivity to that. And the rabbi was so sensitive to another human being's emotions, to another human being's life, that beyond what we, our problem is, we were desensitized. We're so overwhelmed by the pleasures of physicality, like it says of Hasidus, that it neutralizes the, the sensitivity of the spirit. What was your first experience like going to the, you were, you're one of the first rabbis to go, you took the rabbis. I went, to, I, would, went. I would travel, I would visit, I would say at least 25 prisons every year, every two weeks. I would go fly somewhere to visit. I had some extraordinary experiences in prison. Uh, I'll start it, you know, at the prison over here. At that time, the anti-Semitism was vast and radical. If you could imagine. You know, they were controlled by, in most cases, by the white supremacists, the southern prisons. And in other prisons, most Jews did not identify as Jews because they were afraid, literally. Jews, in my, during my Jew period of Olive, during the last... 40, 43 years of working in Olive, I've experienced a Jewish man in Texas murdered, literally, in the shower. Nobody knew why, you know, they make up stories. But prison is a very dark place. It's a very dark place. Thank God there's been some shifting, oh, no. major shifting of more humanitarian attitudes. And thank God the people now in charge of the prisons, I'm going to see her next week, actually, Go to Washington's the director of the bureau, a young a woman who's really a mother. She feels, she understands, like the Rebbe said, it should be a place of rehabilitation, not a place of punish, punishment. In the Torah, the only punishment that's not listed in the Torah is prison. Yeah. 
you have flashes, you have the capital punishment, you have financial punishment. Because prison, according to many commentators, is worse than death. To be in suspended animation is worse than dying. Very nice to be with you. On, on that, before you leave, can you share with us a, a quote that resonates with you? Because we always share a quote with our, a, we part, a parting message. Or I'll, I'll tell you, so it's the, the reader the rep also wrote to me in 1975. I wrote a letter to me personally, but under my name, you can see it, he wrote among his friends, the Shluchim. So it was like a personal, it was a personal letter. And he like included me in the Shluchim. At the end of that letter is the epitaph that gives us our branding. The reverence is over the top. Oh, that's so my message is over the top, get it done. Two factors. Because sometimes you're over the top, you lose sight of where you're standing on the floor. So therefore, that's why marriage works. Because the guys are usually over the top and the women's usually with feet on the floor. Right. So you put it together, <laughs> it's over the top, get it done. So one thing that's unique about shluchim, it's not like a pulpit rabbi will generally have the job of rabbi and the rebbetzin or the or the wife can have something totally separate going on and he sort of, you know, carries the, the fort, holds the fort. Here it's like you really are a team and there's a lot, you know, we know that there's a, the Akaris Abayas who really keeps the, the home and being not just the wife of a shliach but a shlucha yourself and really a team, um, can you tell us more about like what it's like to be the Akara Sabias and to have this whole unity on your shoulders too? Well, so years ago, we, uh, we had a, an audience with the Rebbe, a very beautiful audience. And the Rebbe asked me early on, do you help your husband? That's the way he would speak to us in Yiddish. And I said, uh, I tried to, I was embarrassed. I know I, f I was humbled to say, yes, I do. Well, I, I know I do. I did. I, I do all the time. But when he asked, I said, I try to. So then the river looked at me with, again, he would give me the most beautiful smiles. And, and they're like, I see them all the time. And he gave me that beautiful smile. And he said, well, if you try, then you should, you know, you should do more. So that at that point, my husband said, no, she does a lot. She really does a lot. <laughs> so then the river looked at me. He said, but you are his partner. You are his partner. And I really feel that that, uh, that uh, Schliffus is a partnership. It's a full-time partnership, aside from the fact that you're married, but this is, is, is a, a holy mission that you're on. Uh, Baruch Hashem, it's a sheer vision that I, that I feel that I always wanted to do. Didn't know if I was going to be successful at it. We don't know. Second guess yourself all the time. But um, it, it's, it's actually wonderful working together. Uh, I don't work in the office per se, because then I would have, there would be no separation at all. And, and it would be 24-7. I we can't have that. So I don't work in the office. I come in, I do a, my thing, and I leave. But I'm not a secretary. I don't take care of the books. I don't write checks. I don't have anything to do with the financial concepts there. And, but then we have a lot of time to discuss what to do and how do we deal with this particular situation. And uh, there's a family that needs um, encouragement. So do we speak to the wife or do we speak to the husband or do we speak to the two of them together? So we have a lot of conversation. And people always ask me, when do you have time for yourselves when you're so busy? So we have carved out time for ourselves in the evening. If it can't be at a, at a given time, because it never is going to be a set time, six, seven, eight, whenever my husband will come home, or if I'm out, we will definitely have time in the evenings to make time and, and to discuss, because there's a lot to talk about, not just personal, but in, in this form of Schliffer's work. And um, I would always remember the story that I heard about the Rebbe Sin. There was a doctor who was taking care of the Rebbe. And he came one day and he said that he had a, he had a problem and he was, didn't understand how he could sort of give his all to both, that he had a family, I remember he was talking about his wife, and that he was a cardiologist and that he was very much, you know, caring about his, about his patients and he was finding that he, he just couldn't find balance. So the Rebbe said, I sometimes find myself, and say, sometimes I find myself in that situation and I came up with a solution. These are not verbatim the Rebbe's words, but this is what he did say, uh, paraphrasing. And he said, so I just want to tell you that the 10 minutes that I spend having a tea with the Rebbe said, when I get home is as important to me as my donning of tefillin. Now, that's, uh, that tells it all. 
That tells it all. How precious that time was. They didn't have a lot of time to spend because the Rebbe literally gave us the Rebbe. She knew that in doing so, she was going to take away all of her time, and she would not have that much time with him. She was a very de sincere, devoted chassid of the Rebbe. She was a real chassid of the Rebbe. She understood the greatness of the Rebbe, who he was, because her father made it very clear that there isn't another one. There is no other one. This is the one. And she respected him tremendously. When she spoke about him or she referred to him, it was with the greatest of admiration and, and royalty and respect. She was, she was royal when she, I would see her. I saw, I, saw right, I saw royalty. Everything about her was. And those 10 minutes, so every Jew that puts on tefillin is a very special moment of connection to Hashem. But imagine a Rebbe putting on tefillin. And he was equating that precious connection to Hashem to the time that he spent with the Rebison. So he's teaching us a very important lesson. You get very busy in your shlifas, but you have to carve out time for yourselves because you have to be a very strong unit. And the marriage has to be a strong one to be able to impact others. It's not just that people will look at you as the role models of how do you live your life, but if you're on different pages and you don't and you can't figure out a way to go forward, then how are you going to be? How are you going to be able to lead if you yourselves are in finding yourself? And we don't always agree. I mean, we we really have discussions. What often, happens when what happens often, when you disagree? So we <laughs> we we disagree. I'm very much more of a pragmatic person, and my husband's very much a a, a dreamer. But he's like, like my mother-in-law always says about him. He dreams, but he doesn't sleep. You know, he does. But so we, we go back and forth and we discuss it. And sometimes I see his position and I say, you know, okay, then just go with that. If you think that's your gut feeling that this is the way to go, you know, go ahead and do it. And we pray for the best. And he'll sometimes give me that as well. Sometimes I have to remind him, remember what God said to Abraham Avino? Listen to your wife. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but he knows, I mean, a best friend to a husband is his wife. There's no one that wants what's best for her husband than his wife. And eventually it, it affects the entire family. So what that's really very critically important. So yeah, we can have differences of opinion, but it's okay. And how have you, how have you evolved? Like, how would you say that you both have evolved with time? Well, we've, we've grown stronger <laughs> in our shlifas. Uh, on a regular basis, you're, you're challenged by so many different situations and you learn from from everyone's story. I, I had a call this morning about a young woman with a, a predicament. She wants to do a certain procedure and she knows that her mother is against it. So her question is, do I tell my mother, do I share this with my mother or do I do it and hope she'll never find out? But I'm very close to my mother. I don't want to do that. But at the same time, she will never agree to what I'm about to do. And so here I'm faced with, it's a challenge. And I say to myself, well, what would I do? I, I know what I would do, so I would just share. I would say, I want to share this with you, because I had that relationship with my mother. I want to share this with you, what I want to do. I feel very strongly about it. I have researched the matter, but I want your blessings. And I said to her, does that resonate with you? But if, because if it doesn't resonate with you, then you don't have to do that. But um, as, we, as we face every challenge with every couple or every or, or, or women that come to confide in you about different matters that are going on in their life. It's, it reminds me of when uh, the, one of the Rabbeim uh, would have audiences with people, and by the end of the night, he was he was soaking wet. And, and his son asked him, I remember which Rebbe it was, why are you were sitting in a, in a comfortable room? So he said, when somebody comes in to see me, I have to listen and, and be empathetic and try to understand what they're saying. Then I have to take off my clothes and put his on so I can relate. But then I have to put my clothes back on to be able to answer him. That's a lot of work during one night with so many people coming through. So it's, um, it's a big responsibility, but I always do this before I answer. I just say, Hashem, please direct me, put the words into my mouth, help me through this. I, this is uh, someone's going to be trusting me on something and with the Kayach of the Rebbe and the Shlifos of being uh, an emissary of the Rebbe. I hope that I will guide people. I don't take it frivolously. I don't take it lightly. It's, a, it's an awesome responsibility. I'll tell you what happened this Shabbos that was just 
It's the most unbelievable experience. We had a, a woman and her husband come to speak to us. This, this woman has three children of her own. She came with her husband. Her father is still one of the hostages. And they came because they want to raise awareness. And these are not observant Jews. They came dressed like nice people, but not observant. And he spoke first, and then she spoke, and she came in with a body language that was depressed, sad. She gave up just once. Why are you here? Just to sh so that you remember that I have a father. And that's about it. She can't eat. She can't sleep. She can't take care of her children. She doesn't work anymore. And she's just completely out of it. And I guess for healing, they... The, the trauma uh, experts are recommending that these people go and share their stories, and that helps them. So we were talking, and um, somebody asked, what, well, what do you want from us? What can we do? And all they said was just raise awareness. So I said to them, you know, this Torah portion that we've been reading is about the Jewish people left Egypt. And there were four different categories of the choices of what should we do. We should go back to Egypt. So let's just commit suicide. Let's fight or let's pray. And Hashem said to Moshe, none of the above work right now. I told you to go, so all you have to do now is proceed. Move forward. Just move forward. And I said to her, Natalie, you have to sing and dance again. You have to take your children and bring them hope that there, there, there's good times. Right now is important. And you're the mother. You, you, you're the foundation of the home. You've got to do all this. I know that it's so difficult for you. I don't really feel you. I don't know what it feels like to be in your situation. But just under to understand that this must be so challenging for you. But imagine if you could, what would your father want you to do? And we spoke a little bit about that. And, and then I challenged the people in the room and I said, what are we going to do for, the, for these people? What can we do? And, and we have to do something. We can't just be the same as we were before October 7th. We cannot. And we don't have guns, and we don't have ammunition, and we don't have the know-how. We're not in government. We can't do any of that. But what we can do is go out of our comfort zone, just like our soldiers and our people in Israel. Nobody's comfortable today. Nobody sleeps. The entire country is, is, is optimistic, but there's also a wave of, 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 of pain and, and trauma. It's going to take years and years and years of healing. So what are we going to do? We're not going to sit back and enjoy the sun of Miami Beach. That too. But at the same token, we have to also go out of our comfort zone and do things that are difficult for us and challenging for us so that we can show Hashem how ready we are to, to take up the to take up the cry of all of the people that are that are suffering and, and telling Hashem it's time, it's time for the redemption. So I'm doing all of this and I'm and I'm feeling like, okay, then I turned to the gentleman and I said to him, I'm sorry to be so forward, but would you, if we got you a pair of tefillin, would you, would you agree to put on tefillin every day and pray to Hashem that this mitzvah that you're doing is, is going to be a merit for your father-in-law to come home and for all the other hatofim, but all the other hostages and that there shouldn't be any more soldiers dying and there shouldn't be children that are crying for their parents and, and that are orphaned. And he was like smiling and he was reticent. And I said to him, just jump in and do this. Just, just move forward. And he said, okay, I will. So I said, so tomorrow, Please come to my husband's office and he will give you a pair of tefillin. And then the wife, I said to her, Natalie, what can we do for you? And I was, her response was, can you give me another set of tefillin that I'll put aside so when my father comes home, they'll be ready for him. And everybody in the room was like overwhelmed by that. They were, you felt a paradigm shift. Her body language was different when she walked out. Suddenly, she had something to do. Her husband was going to do something practical. And, and I'm hoping we're going to be in touch with her because she's going to be back in the, in the community. You can speak to her. Ida, she'll be at Verlay's home on Wednesday evening. An amazing, amazing young woman. And you can see that the world is ready, ready to embrace real, authentic mitzvahs, Torah and mitzvahs. It's the only thing we have. How do people live their lives without having that foundation of, of hope and knowing that Hashem is with us? We don't understand Hashem or His ways. It's impossible to. Why things happen the way they do. People are always asking, why are good things happening? 
Why are bad things happening to so many good people? So we, we don't have the answers to those questions. Although Tanya does delve into that as well. But we gave them hope. We gave them, we told them we love you. We care about you. And they saw it and they felt it. it the room was filled. It was about a hundred women that came to listen. And I think they walked out feeling uplifted and, and inspired and excited about um, doing something practical because really Judaism is, is a religion of action. Yes, a woman of action. That, that, wow. You talked about Tanya. And yeah. um, I know that because I live here, uh, a friend of mine told me that I wanted you to give a Tanya class and you were, you're a yes lady. You're saying you were going to say yes, but you were hesitant because you didn't have the background in teaching Tanya. But then you did it, and now it's every time you give the class, it's a full house. And I've heard incredible things about it. I've ended a few. My daughter comes to the yeah. class, and she keeps. Yeah, it's really amazing. So I, I'd love for you to talk about it. Like what, what led you to step out of? I mean, you're out of your comfort zone almost all the time. But what I'm out of my comfort zone. Yeah. I'm out of my comfort zone right now. <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah, I'm out of my comfort That's zone. That's the theme of our conversation. But at, the, at the same time, uh, yeah, being out of your comfort zone, it's okay. We need to do that, right? Uh, yeah. Especially as women, we're very often out of our comfort zone and do what needs to be done. And that's really, you asked about a character bias. That's, that's who we are. We maintain the, the equilibrium, the balance of, of the home with all that's going on out there for our husbands, for our children, for our community members. So Tanya was a subject that when I went to school, it wasn't taught to girls. So we didn't have Tanya as a background. And I did study Tanya. My husband is a phenomenal Tanya teacher. And so I would learn Tanya, but sporadically, I wasn't 100% into doing fitas every single day. And so I didn't have that background. And this opportunity arose and I said, take on the challenge because this is what I said to myself. I'm always asking members of my community to take a leap of faith and do something that they're not comfortable with. And once they'll do the action, all the feelings will come after. So what am I doing? What am I doing? And I had to challenge myself. So I said, I'm just going to say yes and then I'll go from there. So I had to sit down and pay understand what is Tanya and what was the necessity of Tanya and what does it bring to the to the table and why is it the only way that we can live today? I, I feel that, I don't know, my life has taken on the past two years that I'm teaching Tanya. I feel a real metamorphosis in my own self and, and, and how to deal with me. It's like looking deep into yourself and trying to find out, you know, who am I? At times we wake up in the morning and we're in good spirits and everything's I'm happy and Today I'm going to share and I'm going to do and I'm kind and I'm generous and I'm feeling great. And in an hour from now, I'm upset about something and I'm sad or or I um, I see something and I have maybe have an, a certain jealousy of something. So who am I? Like, will the real Tanya Lipsker stand up? And Tanya teaches us um, that, you know, Tanya is not a book to study. It's a book to do. And it's it's personal transformations. First, we have to realize who we are. And when we understand that we are a chilek elokam imamamash, we are an essential piece of Hashem. So when Hashem blew into, into the nostrils of man, the breath of life, he gave him a piece of himself. So once we know that we have this godly soul, this pintaliyid, that is so powerful, but it's dormant and it lies there under the surface. And through studying Tanya, we start to understand that we're not hardwired to be a tzaddik, but we definitely have the capacity to overcome all of these negative energies. They're part of us because we have the animal soul within us. That's very powerful. It's not a negative. It's there. It's part of our anatomy. But we have the ability to be in the driver's seat at all times so that we can control our thoughts and our speech and our action. And that's what that's in the Tanya is called a Bainani. Alavai, we could be a Bainani. So we're constantly being tested. We're constantly struggling, but the struggle is part of our journey. And, and the journey, as if you really sort of allow yourself to get deep into that, you find that it has it makes definitive changes in the way you react, in the way you see things, in the way you relate to other people. You really become a finer, more, you become your, your essential self because you, you become aligned with who you really are. And that godly soul is definitely going to win if we allow ourselves to give it the opportunity to. So which one is going to win, the animal or the godly? It's the one you feed the most. So when your concentration is on, even though you don't feel like it, I'm not in the mood, but you do the do. You just do it. Like my husband said, just get it done. Just get it done. And then you will see that the feelings 
come afterwards and you, you really start to get in touch with your divine essence, with the energy of Hashem that's pulsating inside of every one of us. So I, I'm passionate about Tanya. I spend a lot of time in preparation and I find my day um, so uplifted because what am I doing? While I'm preparing and studying, I'm changing as I go along. And, and I think I'm a, I become a better wife, a better mom, a better grandmother, and hopefully a better shlucha. And you're changing the people, you teach your students as well. Your major. Yes. But I know that in addition to Tanya, you also teach Parsha classes and you also have daily shirim and you have so much going on and you have your work that you do on the side and you have all these things that I'm trying to envision what your day must look like and beyond, I, I, I don't, like, how do you do it? Like, what does time management look like for you? Like for people who are looking to do more, but say, I don't have time. I don't have time. So you know they what they always say, give a busy person a job and they'll get it done, right? Because yeah. there's no such thing as I don't have time. Right. If it's important, if it's important, then you're going to make the time. So I try really to to deal with the most important issues at hand each day and then whatever I could fit in afterwards. But I, I don't sleep for many long hours. I feel that as I get older, I need less sleep. And so... Or is it as you get busy, yeah, you need less sleep. I get very busy and then I have time... My husband doesn't sleep so much as well either. So we have time in the evening, at night. I mean, literally, like at four o'clock in the morning, we'll come up with some brilliant idea and I'll say, write it down because I'm going to forget. Or get your phone and just speak it into your phone. We're going to forget so what we fun. just thought of. Wow. We just, we're going to forget about this great idea that we just had. Wow, Eureka, a, a brainstorm. I find that, again, I said I have another role model, my mother. My mother, uh, my mother was an amazing role model for me. She worked. She was a dress designer. She worked full days. She also did not have help. And she worked so that she can give us more than what my father was able to, to afford. And she wanted us to have it all. So she, my mother was, she would wake up very early in the morning. She would prepare dinner for all of us. My mother never, never wore makeup. She put a drop of lipstick and she looked like a royal queen. And, and she really did. When she walked down the street, she was Reva Minkowitz, I mean, but the hospitality that my mother encouraged, my, my father was a quieter gentleman. He was a deep spiritual soul. I loved him dearly. I never thought I could survive in a world that my father was not in that world. But my mother was the Akira Tabayas. I mean, she was very strong. And she, she would stay up until 4 o'clock in the morning, Erev Shabbos, Thursday night, all night. I would sit with her for many hours so we can talk. I wanted to learn everything. So I learned, I learned how to fold laundry properly. I learned how you don't have to iron because she would teach me how you fold things. You don't have to iron. I watched her um, cook and she did everything with joy and she worked and she had hospitality. And there was one gentleman living on Miami beach who would come to us every, every simple story. He would say, I'd rather sleep under Reva Minkowitz's dining room table than en suite anywhere else. So she was multitasking, but she was smiling. And she was never bitter. She was never angry. She was doing what she loved. And my father would say to her, go to sleep. I should soon go to sleep. I'll very, very soon. And um, I watched all of this at, and I admired her and I respected her. And I wanted, to, I wanted to be like my mother, you know, to be able to do it all. And I'm blessed. Thank you, Hashem, with a lot of energy. So I wake up in the morning energized. And I think the reason is that I, I lead a meaningful life. I lead a life of purpose and meaning. So every day is an, ex is an experience. Every day is, is I'm looking forward to what will the day bring. Oh yeah, I get, I, is, I, people ask me about, you don't have burnout? And I said, I don't, what does burnout? I'm gonna ask you that. <laughs> oh, it's, it's it a question. A question. I, 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 I get these questions all the time. Don't you have burnout? 55 years of slippers, you don't have burnout. I said, how could you have burnout when you see the results of your, of your, of your work? I mean, it, it's just a phenomenal thing you, you put into, no, no deposit, no return. But you, you give so much of yourself to your community. So you don't have burnout. You get tired. Yes, of course you do. You get tired. But it's a different kind of tired. It's a tired, it's a happy kind of tired. I'm exhausted. We get tired at the end of a day if we've done nothing. People go on vacation and they're tired. They say, I need a vacation after the vacation. Here, when you go to sleep at night, you know that you have contributed to so many people's lives. You've made a difference in people's lives. And you grow as an individual, you grow as a couple. Our marriage um, has undergone many different changes, you know, from the early years 
to now, I was a very independent girl. And then I got married. I became very dependent on my husband. I didn't know how to drive when I got married. And my husband said to me, this isn't going to work. You got go get a license. I didn't know how to read a sicha in Yiddish, which was mixed Yiddish and Hebrew, and understand it. So my husband would teach it to me in the early years. And then he said, you need to learn to this on your own. He, he encouraged me and he pushed me. And, and, and as a result of that, I can take a sicha today and, and study it. And because, because I, I love it, I'll, you know, I'll do it. But I watched my mother teach herself English, Yiddish, and Hebrew on her own. She went to school for English, but she taught herself how she spoke the languages. She spoke Hebrew. She spoke Yiddish, not Hebrew, but she wanted to daven. So in order to daven, she needed to learn how to read Hebrew. She came from Russia where she didn't have that great Jewish education. So she taught herself how to read, how to daven. And she davened, she davened with, with all of her heart and soul. For me, my passion is, is Tehillim. I, I love to recite Tehillim. It gives me a tremendous amount of, uh, of peace. And during COVID, I mean, I spent uh, a good part of my day. Is there a mitzvah that you feel passionate about? I feel passionate about uh, Taras HaMeshbacha. I feel passionate um, about Tanya. <laughs> Taras HaMeshbacha, for, for our listeners who don't know the translation of family. Family purity, but the beauty of family purity, not uh, necessarily all the ritual, because people start to look at that as a lot of taboos instead of understanding the, the, the tremendous beauty in, and the, how it enhances uh, the relationship. But all the mitzvahs of the Jewish woman that were given to us are just pivotal mitzvahs that really create the Jewish home. When you think about challah, it's not just taking challah, it's not just baking the challah. It's the, it's the atmosphere in the home that changes. It it's con- contains the, the kashuas as well, the kosher, the kosher diet. And these are mitzvahs that are given to the Jewish woman. On, and, and we're told, I mean, this, this is yours. It's in, your, it's in your domain. Lighting Shabbos light, light, lighting, lighting candles. When you stand in front of those candles, you're ushering in the Shabbos. And at that time, you're able to pray for, for shalom bayis, for, for healthy children. You stand with your, with your arms over your eyes and you're connecting you're connecting to Hashem. It's a beautiful moment. And if women who watch you do it and experience it, they want it in their lives as well. So part of the shlifas is, is having people over at your home. I remember the first years when we came to Bell Harbor, for the first three years, we never had a Shabbos at home because we would have groups and they wouldn't allow us in the village to congregate with groups. So we would do it at the shul. It wasn't a shul. It was uh, three little motels. And we, we actually experienced Shabbos with those singles that were there, and they learned what Shabbos means. This Miro saying, sh- for example, they don't know sh- kid lighting candles, the Kiddush, the Shalom Aleichem, the beautiful poem that a husband reads to his wife, the Eshet Chayel, and they looked at this, is this what Judaism is? We always thought that that the you know women are at the, at the back burner, or they're just there to take care of, of the home, and here the husband is singing her, her praises before the Shabbos begins. It's, it's just so beautiful. We take it for granted because we were raised that way. But for people who are just coming into it, the experience of, of Shabbos is so critically important. And that's what the Rebbe meant when he said Chabad houses. What is a Chabad house? It's to make everybody in the Chabad house feel that their home is a place where they can learn and experience warmth and, 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 uh, and acceptance for just the way I love you, just the way you are. So one of the reasons I really wanted to interview you is because I've always admired you in that you have, well, it's actually, you love Tanya. And in today's Tanya, it says that the, the, um, the body is the garment of the soul. Garment of the soul. And I always, whenever I see you, you're dressed beautifully in beautiful, beautiful clothes, beautiful (laughs) garments. And at the same time, you live a very spiritual life in all the things you're sharing. You teach classes, you, um, bring people into your home. You, you're the Robertson of a community. And how do you not get lost in the physical and maintain that very, that, that um, being inspired by the spiritual and so, tapping into that? I don't want to sound vain. And, and, I, and I don't want to sound that I take things for granted, but I don't need a lot of time to get myself together. I just don't. So if my husband will call me and I am in Publix Market and he says, we have to go out for dinner. How much time do you need? Is 10 minutes enough? That means I have to get home and change. I can do it in 10 minutes. I can do it. I watch my mother do it. I can do it. It's not hard for me. Does that mean that I don't love beautiful clothing? And does that mean that I don't enjoy going shopping? I do. 
but I'm not a person that I, I need, I have to have my manicure, but I'm not a person who goes, needs her massage, and I must have a massage. It's very important in my life. But I tell the women that I, that I relate to, that I speak to, that if this is something you need, then go ahead and have a massage. And if you need a manicure and a pedicure and a facial to make you feel beautiful and good about yourself, then go ahead and do it. Do take care of yourself. The area in, in which I need to be a little bit more proficient is, is, is my uh, physical activity because although I run around a lot, I, I don't have a regimen of exercise, which is something that I need. And I encourage all the women to do so because unfortunately I have osteoporosis and I haven't taken care of it. And it's simply because I just didn't put enough time and importance to it. You can so you can it's still it something that, I, yeah, I say that this is, this is my next major, uh, like I had a watershed moment that I have to teach Tanya. Yeah. This is going to be my new watershed moment. I have accepted upon myself that at this point in my life, my doctor told me it's never too late. And so I will do that. But I think it is important that a woman look as beautiful as she could look. The Rebbe told us that. The Rebbe wanted that the women should wear beautiful wigs so they feel good about it and that they will that they will actually enjoy wearing a wig and that it doesn't look like the wigs of yesteryear where they were so dowdy and nobody wanted to be caught dead in, in a shetel. And it, Didn't it, the Rebbe share something with you about covering your head? No, no, not with me. Oh, not with you. I, th- I don't know why I thought something. No, it was, it was a different woman. I want to say this to you. I used to wear a full shetel, a full wig, and I would wear a hat on top of my wig because in Miami, where it's very humid and sometimes extremely windy, I found it difficult going to shul, have a long walk, and the, sh- the wig would look like a mess. And when I put on my hat, I didn't have to look at myself in the mirror from the time that I got dressed until I would take it off. And um, I had gone to 770. The Rebbe saw me in a hat. So it's not like I was doing something that I didn't think the Rebbe would approve of. But as time wore on and I started to read more and understand that if I'm going to always wear a hat, and I want to back, go back, back up a little bit, and I want to tell you something important about that. When we first started, so, and I was wearing a hat with a, a short shetel, like like a hat on top of a short yeah. shetel. And I remember I walked into, into the, we were at a, um, what was it? It, was, it was a shoe store. That was where our shul started on Harding Avenue in a shoe store. So there was, we took the shoe store, we turned it into a shul, and there was a little office at the side. My husband was in the office, and I came in to ask him a question. And I walked in, and there was a young couple there. They were about to become engaged, but she had issues with modesty, and she had a lot of issues about becoming involved. He was much more, way ahead of her in spirituality and in doing mitzvahs, and she was uncomfortable with the whole thing. Very, very modern, liberated woman, young, beautiful girl with long blonde hair. And I walked in, just happened to walk in. They were sitting there, and she says to my husband, who is that? So he says, oh, that's my wife. She goes, that's a Rebbitson? And... She goes, ah, um, I can do that. I can do that. I can actually put on a beautiful hat and I'll be fine with that. So the Rebbe understood that, that if you are in a community where you're going to be interacting with different types of people, if we're representing royalty and we are royalty, are we not? We're daughters of Hashem, sons of Hashem. The Rebbe was very meticulous. The Rebbe was always meticulous, very well-groomed, very articulate, very elegant. Why? Because if you're representing royalty, then that you dress that way. That doesn't mean you have to wear the very expensive designer clothing. But you always have to be put together and you have to feel good about yourself. So you have that self-confidence to go out there and, and have an effect on others. But if you're dowdy and and what is the word that she used? Frumpy. I always thought Rebbitsons had to look very frumpy and I don't want to be that. And so um, I think it's important and... I feel good when I'm dressed properly. I my kids make fun of me at home. I'm, you know, come to my house at any given time, and I look like I look right now. And that's it. I may not be wearing boots. Sometimes I walk around like this all day long, so I it's get dressed in the morning. And the body's the garment of the soul. But you have, but you have this amazing balance of your essence shining. Through. But but I want to tell you, I don't think I don't like shopping. I do. Less now because the long ones is closed. <laughs> um, but that was my favorite store. Yeah. Yeah. But what was your point about the hat that... Well, why don't I wear a hat over a shetel anymore? Yeah. I'll, I do when it's raining. Otherwise, I'll just wear the wig. 
it's so much more comfortable to just put the hat on top and you don't have to worry about the hairline and that everything is just right. But I gave a class on um, hair covering, which I must have spent a minimum of 10 hours preparing. And there were uh, about 150 women in the room of all walks of life. And it was very challenging for me, very, very challenging for me. But um, I knew it was important because there were so many women that are ready, but they want to really know the real reason for it, some of the Kabbalistics behind it. And it is too long to talk about it here. But when I pointed out one particular woman and I asked her to come up to the front and I said to her, look at this magnificent woman. She's dressed beautifully. And she's wearing a full wig and look at how magnificent she looks. And she's not looking to be attracting to anyone. And there's a big difference between being attractive and attracting. And a woman, when she gets dressed in the morning, should ask herself that question. What am I, we, we present ourselves by, by the, how we dress. You wear different garments when you're going to office building, different garments when you're going to a party, to a wedding, different garments, right? When you get dressed in the morning, every woman should ask herself this question. What am, how am I being presented to the outside world? What, what message am I giving them? So if it's a message, of, I want to be attractive, then that's great. And be as attractive as you can be. But if it's about being attracting, then you know you're, you're not doing the right thing. And I'll tell you, I once went with a friend of mine. This doesn't have to be on there. I was on <laughs> at the friend of mine to a store that was going out of, uh, uh, out of business. Lily Rubin was the name of the store. It was this magnificent dress. And I, I tried it on, and it was, it was beyond breathtaking. So I called a friend of mine. I said, it's so gorgeous, and I want to buy it because they were going out of business. So it was 75% off, and she said to me, so honey, tell me, do you feel like strutting? And I said, oh, my God, that's the word. I'm not buying the dress. Because when I put that on and I walked across the room, that's what it felt like. I said, I can't buy it because that is not a good reason to buy that dress. I will feel like strutting when I wear it. And I'm, I don't want to ever feel that way. So I put it down. So it was as beautiful as it was. It wasn't meant, it was not for me. So I think we have to keep that in mind. So what was the, with this class that you gave to women on the hair color, hair color, what was the highlight? Like what was something that spoke Something that spoke to people was that they started to understand how significant and important it is for themselves, for their husband, for their children, for generations to come. That, that cover, that it's not about how your hair is covered. If it's, if it's, the Rebbe didn't, didn't, the Rebbe stressed wigs, but if a woman wants to cover her hair with a hat or a scarf, this is her initiation into covering her hair fully. And she understands that it, it's a feeling that you have for yourself that I'm a married woman and I have to conduct myself in that way. And it's, it's a personal, it, it's a paradigm shift in how you walk into a room and how you relate to other people. It's not about, oh, this is the comment all the time. Well, the wigs are much more beautiful, and so they're much more attracting. And I see these women with these gorgeous wigs, and they look so much better than I look with my horrible hair. I said, because it's not about that. It's about how a woman feels and what the benefits of what accrues to her family by her hair being covered. And there is a very big difference when your hair is covered and uncovered. And the Kabbalistic reasons for it are very lengthy, and it, it was an hour and a half class, and it, I won't do it any kind of justice, but it behooves everyone to really look into the deeper meaning yeah, I of why. Yeah, I class, my friend, Malki Lang, just did one in her father's honor, and yes. there was someone who spoke on the Kabbalistic and meeting, and I thought it was so helpful. It's very helpful, and that's what we made it to many of the women that were uh, pretty much on, on the cusp of whether or not they wanted to cover the hair, and it made a difference. Several of them have put on wigs when they understood what happens, the dynamic after a woman is married between a, the husband and the wife and the Kabbalistic combinations that, that there's a certain element of holiness and purity that needs to be maintained and the covering of the hair will provide that. So who doesn't want that in their family? And the Rebbe had shared so many times how, how many brachas you will receive in the your blessings, family. The blessings are great. It was never a challenge. Covering hair was never a challenge for me. For many women, it is. Do you find that it's more challenging in the heat? Florida? I don't even think about it. I put it on in the morning. I take it off at night. I really don't spend too much but time worrying about it. Many yes, of the community. Yes, it's challenge. hot, and and when it's windy, it's uncomfortable. And I said, but it's well worth it, isn't it? So that was our uncomfortable. It's hard having a baby. Pardon? 
I've heard someone say stilettos are uncomfortable. Oh, heels. Yeah, but <laughs> stilettos, stilettos are uncomfortable, like but they're gonna, but they wear the heels if right. they're uncomfortable. Right. Right. I happen to be lucky. I'm very comfortable in heels. Okay. Well, I'm just good. saying, it's 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 very comfortable. That's right. it. How could you wear heels at your age? My mother wore heels until she was 75. It's just genetics, and it's I, I, it's just a fact. That's it. I'm as comfortable, more comfortable that way. But there are people who are uncomfortable in heels, and they'll still wear it because they feel that they look better. So, and that's just very materialistic, and you can call it. Uh, hedonistic when it comes to spirituality that's how you know that that is the little voice of the evil inclination coming in and telling you but it's so uncomfortable right. Right. and uh, it, it's not only about comfort you try to get a wig that's comfortable you try five different wigs you try it and you, you wear like you said you wear high heels you go to a wedding you could you can't move you can't dance you can't breathe but you're wearing those high heels because they're because they make you look a certain way and besides the fact that the wigs are very beautiful today, and they should be, and a woman should feel beautiful. The Rebbe stressed that. So if the Rebbe could tell us that that's important, then I want to share one story with you that I shared with my women at the class that was such a powerful story. The Rebbe spoke very often about, not made very often, but he did speak about the importance of our Hebrew names, that we should all know what our Hebrew name is. One of the things about the Jewish women in, in Egypt is that they maintained their Hebrew names. So it was a woman's prison that we were going to. I was going with a friend of mine, going back years. We had to visit two, two prisons. One was in the morning, mid-morning, and the other one was going to be in the afternoon. But for some technical reasons, not unco very uncomfortable reasons, we needed to switch and go to the morning one the, in the afternoon and the afternoon in the morning. But then there's a lot of red tape. You have to get permission from the warden. There's a lot of bureaucracy there. And we did what we needed to do. And we arrived at the prison that we were meant to be in afternoon, late afternoon, and we arrived there at 10 o'clock in the morning. So they brought in these women, ten, nine Jewish women that we were going to speak to. And at the door opened, and a, t a tenth woman was wheeled in in a wheelchair. And she was a very beautiful woman sitting in a wheelchair. She was a double amputee. And she had been in prison for years. And her son and her husband were in different prisons. We're going to be there for a very long time. Well, the whole family was in. The whole family was in prison. It was a business that they had that they did some uh, not good things. Mm -hmm. So they were there, and she hadn't seen her her husband or her son in years, and she had diabetes and wasn't taken care of. She ended up double amputee. Very very sad woman with sad eyes, so beautiful. Her eyes were so sad. They wheeled her in. And I said to myself, I, I, I had prepared the program, but how do I even begin? Hashem, please, please, please help me. So I decided as, as a, you know, to break sort of the, to break the ice, I said, why don't we just go around the room and we'll each introduce ourselves with our Hebrew names because a Hebrew name is very powerful. It's the name of the soul. They went around the room. Some had Hebrew names, some didn't. Some I knew what they were. Then it came to her turn. And she said, my name is Hannah. I was like, your name is Hana, And I began to explain to her what the meaning, I said, my name is Hana as well. So we share something very powerful. And I explained to her, what, what is the meaning of a Hebrew name? And what is the meaning of her Hebrew name? What it stands for? The three mitzvahs of a Jewish woman. And I went through all of them. And, and she's crying. She's crying. And the women know her. So everybody is like commiserating with her. And this is what she said. She said, I woke up this morning and I said, God, you have forgotten about me. So has everybody else. And I'm done. I can't do this anymore. So today is my last day here and I'll do what I need to do. If you even know that I'm alive, then give me a sign that you know that I exist and you came here in the morning, and you told us about how you had to rearrange your schedule. And now you're telling me that my name has so much power. God, you gave me my sign. It was like there was the, we, we couldn't speak afterwards. There was nothing more that we need to do. And of course, we did. We share words of Torah. But you can just see how when you're doing the Rebbe Shlifus, he, he created this change in plans. And why did I think of it? I didn't think of it of myself. I didn't, I, I didn't know what to do. 
I said, I should help. The rep is at my side. You've got to help me. So when you're representing a power that we represent as shluchim, we just have to know that we, we, we need to be on the right track doing what the Rebbe wants us to do. We can't lose focus of that. I'm a shlucha. You have to say to yourself sometimes, is this the right thing to do? Am I doing the right thing? Yeah, you can't second guess yourself. You have a mashpia. I have a mashpia. I have to run through that mashpia. I speak to my husband before I make serious decisions because I know that it's critically important. And when you're in a leadership position, and people are looking to you for guidance, it's, it's an awesome responsibility. Can't take it lightly. It's a privilege. The responsibility is a great privilege. And, and for someone who would say, well, I'm not a leader, but the truth is that we are all leaders. Okay, for sure. Every single woman in her home is the queen of the home. She's the Akira Tabayeth. And what does it mean, Akeris Habayis? And you translate it, it's the ikar, it's the mainstay of the home. You walk into someone's home, just by the surroundings, the energy is the energy of the woman. It just, it just is. The colors that she chose, the art on the walls, the furniture that's in the room, that's all the physical material part. And then the spiritual energy of the home, it's the mother who's gonna make sure that the children say Moda'ani in the morning, it's the mother is going to make sure that the children will make a bracha before they eat. They spend more time with the children. It's the mother, the woman, that's going to make sure that there's Shema Yisrael at night. And if you are very careful that there's a little basin with a negelvasar, the mother who is going to open up a siddur when the children are aware, my mother davens. Well, if my mother doesn't daven, then on Sundays when I'm not in school, then why should I? The mother is the role model. Children do not learn by what we tell them. They learn by what they experience. And so it's a full-time job being the Akerit Habayi. Even the way you speak to your children, the patience that you have with them, how do you treat your visitors when they come to your home? Are you upset when your husband wants to give more tzedakah than you feel he should? There's a gentleman that I know. Listen to what he said. He's a big philanthropist. He said, I can never tell my wife how much tzedakah I gave to any given person. And you're shocked by that statement. Then he qualifies it and he says, because no matter how much I gave, she would always say, why didn't you give more? Do you know that um, that story, I thought you were going to say something different, but that story is um, my grandfather. You know my grandfather, Mr. Um, Mendel New, and my grandmother, of course. of course. He says that same thing. He says whenever he'd give tzedakah, my grandmother would say to him, did you give enough? Did you give enough? Did you give enough? So this teaches the children something. Um, and what are the priorities of, of, of the mother? Now, the mother couldn't have a priority. The house has to be beautiful, neat, clean, the furniture. The mother is dressed impeccably, but is that all she is? Like a Barbie doll and there's nothing more to my mother? No. My mother is like the song that we sing. My my noble mother, what is the song that my noble mother I does used, ask? I used to think, I used to think my mother was a, was a Shabbos queen. She stands so regally with the, royal grace yes. and whispers to the king of the universe, her yes. fam, with a very special face behind, no, but with a very special smile, grace, grace, grace. Oh, yeah. my she was grace. behind her covered face. Diamonds. I know that she's not asking, asking me for diamonds. diamonds. My noble mother doesn't ask That's for gold. jewels, for gold. Yeah. I just have to add, that's my mother. Yeah. She never asked for and jewels. I know that. And <laughs> she's asking me, for? she's asking me to help me study all the Torah's so, ways and go and right should let her eyes behold the joy as she grows old. As she grows old. And children that have mothers like that will give us a tremendous amount of nachas. And there's a lot of investment, time, and energy that goes into it. But if we understand that the focal point of our life is the nuclear family, no matter how busy you are on shlifas, the Rebbe pointed it out many, many times. Not at the expense of your family. Never at the expense of your family. And that's sometimes with large families that you have to juggle the two. We had two children. For us, it was not very difficult because there's five-year difference. And even though my kids would say the community came first, 
Yeah, but you know what? They said the community came first, but they were shluchim, and they are today powerhouse shluchim. They grew up in a home where they experienced what shlifus means. And they may have resented times when we were not taking them on vacation the way other families were, but they appreciated it. And that's why today they are who they are. So I think that there's a combination, but we do, we definitely have to give our children time, priority that they know that they're an integral part. The most important person in a woman's life should be her husband. That's priority number one. And then come the children. And very often couples do not understand that. And that creates a lot of shalom bias issues because a healthy marriage, a strong marriage is what gives children security, self-confidence, and it's what builds the home. So that's the most important person that we have to consider and respect and give time to. And it's worth, it's worth all the investment, worth it all, trust me, so that after 55 years of marriage, you can still look at each other with respect, admiration, and love, and it's really important. In that order, because what did somebody once say? Love, shmov, what is that? It's communication, respect, admiration. That's all integral. And then you have that, that that's love. How many years have you been married for? 55 years. Till 120, I always say, gosh, 120. But I always add this. We always say, we, when I give somebody a blessing, they ask for a blessing, I say, may you live till 180, till Mashiach and with Mashiach. Not just till Mashiach. We worked really hard for Mashiach to come. I did want to ask you for someone that also, for someone that is not on shluchas. And yes. There's, there's plenty, there's many of our listeners from, from of all walks of life. What would you say to them for somebody who didn't experience yeah. living with the time when the rebel was alive? And what should they, what can you share with them to take with them in order for them to live their best life? So first of all, I would encourage everyone to study Tanya. It, it's, 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 it's transformational. And yes, it's I agree. Ongoing. It's, Do you like the new Steinsalz, Tanya? Because I think it's... I, I'm starting to look at it. I'm using other svarim, and I've listened to a lot of tapes, listened to a lot of svarim, and then I all, I'll, I'll always confer with my husband, as he said. Sometimes I say, enough already, you, you have it. <laughs> is that favorite Tanya my, book? My, my, um, I don't have a favorite right now. Oh, the one that I use is, is the one of um, Haya Miller's. Yeah. That's the one that I use as text because it's the most, I think it's the easiest to, uh, to comprehend, and I want it to be, it's more of a lay... Tanya that they can read. Uh, but you I, should get the Tanya's Yes, book. I know. And it actually has the Rebbe's blessing I know. in the front. I know. My husband yeah. has it, and that's what I'm going to tackle now. But I agree. It's such a it's such oh, a life changing. It's a life changing. It's it's a life changing. It it's so, you know. I, I'm going to tell you something. After I went through that fire, when I was I was down, I was down because I, I was expecting a baby. I didn't know what the future would be. The Rebbe gave us a very wonderful, beautiful blessing, but I wasn't feeling well, um, and. I, I had to continue being a shlucha, and I didn't have the comfort of just being lazy and just trying to deal with my emotions, and I just get on with life and do what you have to do. I taught at the time, so I was teaching full-time, and and um, the rabbi gave us those wonderful, beautiful blessings, but you, I just wanted to mention that, that you just can't just lie there and, and, and wallow in your own misery because it, it it's just counterproductive. And it, sadness brings out the worst in us. I mean, when we're sad, God Rabbi Tanya tells us that that sadness is, is, is where the Yetzirah creeps in and then, he's, then he rules over you. So we have to be besimcha because when you're besimcha, your life is about alacrity. There you go. You have to wake up ready to take on the day with positivity and full energy because if you're happy, why am I happy? Because Hashem just gave me life. I just said moda ani in the morning. Thank you, Hashem. I don't take it for granted because according to the doctors, I literally had died. There was no heartbeat. There was nothing. There was no pulse. There was just nothing there. How many years ago were you in a fight? Oh, it was when I was pregnant with my daughter. And one of my friends had written into the Rebbe, called in and said that she's davening for my soul because I had literally died. Because they took me out, there was nothing there. So there was no pulse. They really... So when I woke up and I realized that was my watershed moment of understanding that if God gave me back my life, then I better do and do and never stop doing. And so I, that was a big motivation. And people ask me, does that cough bother you so much? Look at I haven't coughed once here, right? Just a little tiny bit. Just in the beginning and then you went sailing. It happens sometimes. So when I do cough, it's I, I believe it's Hashem reminding me 
Keep going. Okay. You can slow down. You have another day. You were gone. You're here. What are you going to do with this day? How are you going to make this day meaningful? Okay, so every single woman in her home is the pivotal person in that home. How many hats does every woman wear? Many. Many. Can we count it? The time you wake up in the morning, you're busy. You're a chauffeur. You're a doctor. You're a nurse. You're a psychiatrist. You're a psychologist. You're a therapist. You are a, a homemaker. You are the one that brings them lunch. You have forgot my lunch. I forgot. Mommy, drive me. You're a chauffeur. You are doing, you're a nurturer. You're constantly doing things. And we wear so many ads. That in itself. And then we have to be there for our husbands when, we, when he comes home. So we multitask. And Hashem gave us this capacity. This is what we have to understand. We say that Hashem doesn't give us a role or a job that we can't that we can't that we can't overcome. So think about it. When God created man, he created man from the dust of the earth. But woman was taken from from man, meaning that she already is a higher level. But listen how Hashem describes the creation of woman. What does it say? Vayiven et hatsela. And he built from the rib. Vayiven has the same etymology as Bina, which is the expansion. So Chachma is the Eureka, and, and Bina is that expansion. So what is our role? We take the raw material and we turn, like we do with cooking, with baking. We take all the raw materials and we turn it into the best breads with the delicious challah. We take raw materials of our home and we build, we build our children. We, every, every, every day, imagine a mother that is able to sing while she's cooking. Imagine the music playing in the home while, when, as the children come home, sending off the children with a beautiful smile and I go, oh, you forgot your lunch. Oh my God, you're not wearing, oh, you, you forgot the uniform. You wake up 10 minutes earlier. You take charge of your home. You're like the CEO of your, of your home. You are in charge. You can't wait for the husband to do that. It's not going to happen. What happens when a mother goes out of town for a few days and the father sort of has to take to take over the raids and there are no older children? It, it could become chaotic, but we can do it all. So every woman needs to know the tremendous power that Hashem has gifted her with. It's a tremendous opportunity. We are molding the future generation. The most important thing in the world are the children. These are the leaders of the next generation in every respect healthy children that grow up with a good sense of self and know what their mission in the world is. And we have a collective mission to make this world a dwelling place for Hashem through Torah, through mitzvahs, through kindness, through generosity. And that's really what the, what the woman embodies. So every woman has that role. If, if a woman feels like that, that was so empowering. Thank you for sharing. If, if a woman feels like she has regrets or like, let's say maybe, do you ever feel like you've had regrets and what would you do with that? A regret, so I don't like to focus on regret because it's done and there's no, there's nothing to do about it, but I use it as a, as a, as a stepping stone for, well, I, I regret that I did that. I can regret and now I want to move forward. I'm not going to allow myself to feel guilty about it. That's not a, guilt, by the way, comes straight from the Yei Sahara. Regret Regret is okay. We have to regret if we did something. If you if you hurt somebody inadvertently or you made a choice that you now realize was the wrong choice, I have regret. But it, 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 I'll use that as a stepping stone for knowing what to do the next time and it's as a learning experience. But we, we're humans. That's what the Tanya teaches. We are strugglers every day of our lives. But we're in the driver's seat. We could always make the right choice. And that's what we are empowered to do. And this is what Tanya teaches us, and this is what we, how we should live our lives. And it's doable. And it should be enjoyable at the same time. Thank you. Amen. Live in the moment. Live in the moment. So whatever you're doing, it, do it. Do it completely. Do whatever you're doing with, with all of your focus, with integrity, with honesty. And just live in the moment to do the right thing. Always do the right thing. So there are not too many regrets. That's beautiful. Thank you. 